morning, everyone. Morning. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I'm not real skilled with PowerPoint. I usually use a device called a trial trial pad on the iPad, so I'm more familiar with that. I wanted to say something before I start this Dharma talk about what Master said um, on our daily in our daily lives. Uh, he told us, stay out of here and try to stay in the body. I think he's described walking meditation. It's all contact, paying attention to the contact and staying out of the mind. I think there's 84,000 seconds in a day and we have 90,000 thoughts a day. 90,000. Now you know why the Buddhists call it the monkey mind. Because we jump from one thought to the next, and most of the time there's no pattern. So if you can take the advice that Master gave you and stay out of this space and stay in the contact daily, contact of the hand, contact of the foot, it really makes a tremendous difference. But I am... My Dharma talk today, which is my first one since COVID, uh, so you can probably understand I'm a little bit nervous. This is going to be on the difference between Mahayana Buddhism and Theravada Buddhism. But before we even get there, we have to go back in history to what was really the foundational uh, aspects of Buddhism itself. There was a man born as a prince. His name was Siddhartha, Prince Siddhartha. And his father was a king of a, of a land in Northern India. And he was born into a family with vast riches, just unbelievable riches. He could have anything. And his father made sure that he never wanted for anything. He had a number of women that waited on him, all the money and possessions that he could possibly have. But he was kind of a unique individual because he wasn't happy with that. And he tried to, to get outside of that bubble that his dad had placed him in, that bubble of wealth and opulence and frankly, getting anything he wanted. And so he snuck out with some of the guards and he went through the cities around his palace and he saw that people were suffering. There were people that had no food that were begging on the street. He saw a man dying just slowly and no one to help him laying in the road. And all of this, these experiences made him think that if I'm not happy with everything I've got and these people on the other extreme aren't happy, then maybe there's a way that I can find happiness in between those two extremes. Before he did that though, he went off, he gave up everything that he had. I mean everything. He walked away from his child he walked away from his wife. He walked away from all the riches that any of us could ever imagine. He gave it all up. And he became what's called an aesthetic. And he lived in the forest. He ate very little. In fact, practically starved himself because he thought that that extreme would help him be happy that he could find happiness and find the purpose of life if he just beat himself up, if he denied himself food, if he denied himself sleep, if he, if he inflicted harm on himself. And he did that for six years. And at the end of those six years, he was no more near happiness than he was when he had everything. And so at the age of 35, 
and he'd had a long career of meditation. But at the age of 35, he finally sat down under a tree and he sat there, according to the historical record, for six days. And on the sixth day, he became enlightened. And he saw that there was a middle way, a middle path, and that is why we are here today. That was the founding of, of Buddhism. And immediately after he was enlightened, people could see it in his face. He had a glow about it. And the people that had been aesthetics with him, some of them rejected him, but some of them saw something different in him. And so they, they came to him and he started preaching or giving sermons, whatever you want to call it. It was a teaching. He started teaching about enlightenment and emptiness and impermanence and how life is by its nature dukkha in Pali, unsatisfactory. No matter where you find yourself, unless you have a significant control over your mind, and you can remain in a calm state and tranquil, then you're going to find unsatisfactoriness in life. One of the other things that he found was the concept of impermanence. You cling, you cling, but you can't cling long. Nothing lasts forever. Any conditioned phenomenon, the Buddha taught, any condition phenomenon is impermanent. So the Buddha taught from the age of 35 until the age of 80. And in that time, I think he gave 83,000 different teachings. And he didn't, he never proclaimed himself to be a god. In fact, he disavowed that. He said, I'm just a man. I just found the right path. And he would teach to anyone, really, that would listen. Poor people, beggars, the sick, all the way up to kings. Everybody wanted to hear the Buddha because of his wisdom. He taught for those 45 years, and at the end of his life, he had a vast amount of work that was stored in his mind. But he had given so many teachings. He had people around him that knew those teachings. So at the end of his life, those people came together within about 90 days. And that's what we call the first Buddhist council. And in the Buddhist council, the goal was to make sure that the Buddha's word was available into perpetuity for as long as anyone would listen. So what they did in the first Buddhist council was, the person that ran it was probably the most trusted monk of the Buddha. His name was Maha Kasapa. And he was an elder monk and he was quite, quite respected and very, very wise. He called together 499 monks and he he picked out the monks that were able to assimilate assimilate what the buddha had taught that they had vast knowledge because what they did was they they came together in the first council and they recited what's called the vinaya which are the monastic rules and the dharma which are the sermons that the Buddha gave. 
the teachings, the sutras. And there were two people that were critical to this work. One monk was named Upali, and the other was Ananda. Now, there was some controversy of this first council because Ananda was not enlightened as all of the other monks were. All of them were Arahats but him. And there was some consternation that why should Ananda be included? But Ananda had been the right-hand man for the Buddha for 25 years. He had heard every sermon and he had a remarkable memory. So he could recite everything that the Buddha had taught. At the convening of the first council, Ananda came in and he was beaming. And everyone knew that he had gained enlightenment the night before. So they accepted him as the 500th monk and they sat in the first council and recited all of the 500 approximately rules of the monastic order. And then they recited all the sutras and each of those 500 monks then went out and taught it to others so that they could perpetuate, perpetrate, say the, the Buddha's word for per perpetuity. There really was no controversy at that first council. Uh, everybody was in agreement. There was some discussion about how the Buddha said that after I'm gone, the Dharma should be changed, but the, the monastic rules of the Vinaya, they can be changed, uh, but just the minor ones. And this was at the Buddha's on his deathbed and Ananda's there attending him. And of course, Ananda is seeing his master pass away. And so he didn't think at that time, had the presence to say, well, which rules are minor and which rules are major? So they didn't change any of the rules. And the primary reason was that it was 90 days after the Buddha's death and they didn't really want to disrespect him. At that time, there was no Theravadan. There was no Mahayana Buddhism. There was only the Dharma, the, the truth, according to the Buddha. So we go about 100 years from there, and we have what's called the Second Buddhist Council. And at the Second Buddhist Council, there's a similar gathering of monks, and there was controversy at this one because there had been some monastic orders that had taken to drinking fermented beverages, alcohol, and handling money. The monastics were not supposed to get involved with handling money, gold and silver at that time. There were actually 10 rules that were in controversy that one set of folks wanted to repeal, and the other set, the majority, did not want to repeal. One of the rules was that some of the monks were keeping salt in an animal horn secretly so that they could salt their food, their alms food, and that was against the monastic order. So some of the rules were kind of Sounds kind of silly, but the other ones were quite serious because intoxication is not something that allows the mind to stay clear. And certainly the handling of money could lead to corruption. So that second Buddhist council took place about 100 years after the first, 100 years after the death of the Buddha. And because they couldn't agree on the rules. The majority said, we're not changing anything. Then a small group broke off and they were called the Maha Sanghika, that group or the great community is what it stands for. It was not yet known as Mahayana Buddhism. After this council, the third century BC, under the rule of Emperor Asorka, there was a third Buddhist council. And at this time, there was a trusted, uh, trusted monk, 
Mangalaputta Tisa that ran the uh, that ran the council, and there became a dispute in this council as to those rules that had been left unchanged, and so that there was quite a schism. But uh, Tisa refuting the the monks that wanted to change all the rules wrote a book and this was the beginning of Theravada, the Theravada Buddhism. And also during the third Buddhist council, one of the important things that happened was that the king whose son was a monk, Mahindra, he and several other monks took the Dharma and spread it throughout all of Asia, really. Uh, Mahindra himself took it to Sri Lanka, and Buddhism is still strong in most of those countries, present-day countries, Thailand, Burma, Laos, uh, Sri Lanka, Cambodia. So it was a very important time for the spread of Buddhism. And shortly it went into China as well. We find that the, the first time we hear of Mahayana is about the first century BC to the first century AD. Um, and it first appeared in what's called the Lotus Sutra. This is one of the most important Mahayana sutras that we have. Uh, the first real monk to write extensively on Mahayana Buddhism is Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna found that there were important elements of Buddhism that had not been developed. So one of those was sunyata or emptiness. The Buddha always talked about how everything is empty. Emptiness is a primary concept and Nirgarjana was the one that really uh, defined the term and introduced Mahayana Buddhism. So we have Differences between Theravada Buddhism, which is a little older, and Mahayana Buddhism, but there are a lot of similarities. For example, uh, both schools accept Shakyamuni Buddha, the original Buddha, formerly Prince Siddhartha, as the teacher. They both <coughs> ascribe to the Four Noble Truths. The Noble Eightfold Path is the same in both schools. The concept of dependent origination is the same in both schools. Both schools reject the idea of a supreme being, of a God that created and governs over all of us and the world. Both accepted what we talked about earlier, Anicca, impermanence, Dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, and anatta or non-self, sila, samadhi, pana, and there's no difference between those acceptances. One, one of the areas that I found there was a difference, although it's a subtle difference, is the is the bodhisattva idea, and so. Most people understand that Mahayana Buddhism has three vehicles, we call them, to Buddhahood. The Sama Sam Buddha, who gains full enlightenment by his own effort. The Prajika Buddha, who has lesser qualities than the Sama Sam Buddha. And the Savaka Buddha, who is an Arahant. The Buddha was an Arahant the Nairhat disciple. In order to attain those Buddhahoods, those enlightenments, it's basically the same steps that you have to take. 
but the Sam Buddha has qualities and capacities that are above the other two. What those are, I could not find. It is clear that both Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism are both dedicated and committed to the well-being of the human, of oneself, and to all other sentient beings. So they're the same on that. And that the liberation is the ultimate goal. It's been said that the orientation of Theravada Buddhism is more ethical, while Mahayana is both ethical and metaphysical. And if we talk about Nagarjuna, who was along with uh, there's one other monk that is uh, Buddha Gosa that is very important to Mayana Buddhism. They both have extensive writings and teachings with respect to the Mayana tradition. Now, <laughs> For example, Nagarjuna taught, uh, wrote the Lotus Sutra, he wrote the Heart Sutra. He wrote a, a little known text that I discovered when I was doing research for this called The Good Hearted Letter. And he wrote that to uh, the king that was his benefactor, Gotam Putra, who was the son of Queen Bala in Northern India. And to end this talk, I'd kind of like to give you some of those teachings that were translated by a guy named Santini in 2002. So some of the translation is going to have a modern tilt on it. But I thought these could be helpful. This is from the Good Hearted Letter by Nagarjuna. Abandon resentment even towards those who have caused you harm. Harboring enmity or an intense feeling of anger in this fashion only provokes further conflict and causes more suffering, thereby adding to the harm already done. Consequently, give up ways, this way of thinking, and sleep peacefully. The name of this book is Causality and Nagarjuna, I think. It's from 2002. The next quote that he translated was, the mind's nature is to retain ideas for different lengths of time, just as writing on water, earth, or stone endures for a short, middling, or long time, respectively. Strive to let go of unwholesome ways of thinking quickly as you can, as if they were written on water, while retaining wholesome attitudes as if they were written on stone. And the last one I'd like to share with you is, your mind is the most valuable thing you possess. The mind can make you happy or miserable according to how you treat it. If you owned a valuable house or car, remember this is a 2002 translation, or painting, you would take good care of it to keep it from getting damaged. If you have children, you know that you would treat them so carefully and protect them from harm. The same applies to your mind. Take good care of your mind. And don't let it get entangled in, harm, in harmful distractions and unwholesome ways. I think everybody could take that to heart. Thank you. That's all I've got. <laughs>